The Phoenicians, using the excellent sand found at the mouth of the Belos River, developed commercial lines of bowls and other vessels. All this glass was cast, built up, or ground. Glass blowing came later. Uh, the glass was cast, built up, or ground. Ground glass. God. The Phoenicians and their neighbors, the Syrians and the Jews, were the first to make glass cheap enough so that ordinary folk could afford glass drinking vessels instead of cups of pottery or metal. The Phoenicians, or their neighbors, the Syrians. In early Achaemenid times, glass was so precious that only the king of all kings and his grandees could afford to drink from goblets of glass. But a few centuries later, thanks to the Syro-Phoenician glassmakers, nearly everybody could afford this luxury. Luxury. To have shards of glass around. Great. Um, although the Phoenicians were the leading explorers, seamen, manufacturers, and traders of their time, no people can be good at everything at once. For instance, Phoenician art is of poor quality. The Phoenicians never really tried to develop a distinctive style of their own. Instead, they mass-produced cheap copies of the artworks of the Egyptians or the Greeks and peddled these gimcracks to the eager barbarians on the fringes of civilization, from Scythia to Portugal and from Senegal to Britain. I don't know exactly how true it is. It sounds like he's got... a. T He's sort of saying that commercialism is cheap and bad and not culturally admirable. I don't buy it. Their literature likewise, likewise does not seem to have amounted to much, so far as we can judge from the few scraps that have come down. Most of it seems to have perished in the destruction, one after the other, of the Phoenician cities. Sidon was destroyed by the Persians in 345, Tyre was destroyed by Alexander in 332, Carthage by the Romans in 146 BC, and Beirut by Tryphon, the Seleucid king, in 140 BC. Alright, skipping down a bit, we're not worried too much about all that business. In the second millennium BC, in Crete, a line of sea kings, ocean sea kings, ruling from Knossos, built exquisite, unfortified palaces with stone walls and post and lintel colonnades. Now, I pause for a second. They were unfortified palaces. Now, archaeologists seem to have learned from this. They think, think they've learned. Some of them think they've learned that if these palaces were not fortified, that's because these cities were extremely strong and powerful and not, were not afraid of foreign attack. But we might reserve the possibility that it was simply a peaceful era and that trade flourished, which is what made all this wealth possible, and that war was just not as common, oddly enough, for 100 or 200 years or whatever, and it's come down in this form of these massive palaces. It doesn't necessarily mean they were massive, powerful civilization. It could have been a period of peace, and the wealth produced wasn't necessarily, didn't necessarily have to be strictly tribute, taxation, and war booty. It could have been from trade. Who knows? Pillars of tree trunks installed upside down, lest they begin to sprout during the rainy season, supported the lintels. Ceramic drain pipes carried away the water from elegant baths. The pastel murals with which the walls were decorated still show us youths and maidens performing perilous gymnastics on the horns of bulls while long-haired cretin men in loincloths and ladies in off-the-bosom dresses look on. Yeah, ladies, women wore uh, their breasts out as a matter of style. And your dress decorated around the breast. Now, a lot of the artwork that has come to us as, as um, the Palace of Knossos was actually recreated with absolutely no... The guy who recreated had absolutely no idea. I got this from the teaching company lectures about ancient Mesopotamia. When they recreated these palaces, um, they would have sometimes 16 inches or so at the bottom of a four-foot-tall mural, and he would recreate the rest. He would just make it look good from no, as far as we can tell, as far as he had any reason to tell us, he, he had no reason to make it one way or, or the other. 
He had something to start with at the bottom, and then his imagination had to take the, the rest of it. A lot of the murals in that place are like that. So take those with a grain of salt. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like he's aware of that. Here. All right, let us continue. Smaller palaces rose at Malia on the north coast and at Phaistos on the southern coast. Whether these cities were parts of one realm or capitals of rival states, we know not. About 1700 BC, an earthquake shook down these palaces. Soon they rose again, more splendid than ever, and stood until the downfall of Minoan civilization about 1500 BC. The likeliest cause for this downfall, uh, the likeliest causes for this downfall are the great eruption of the island of Thera, which blanketed the eastern Mediterranean with volcanic ash, and deforestation, which deprived the Minoans of timber for their galleys on which their sea power depended. So, it says on the one hand possibly a volcano exploded, on the other hand possibly they'd cut down other trees. And I think if that was what it was, they might have got trees somewhere, went and got ships, maybe. Uh, but the island of Thera blowing up might have been the basis for the later myth about Atlantis. Less gorgeous to look upon than the Cretan palaces, but just as important from the engineering point of view, was the stone-paved road that stretched away from Knossos and possibly linked all three capitals. It's a fairly small island, but it was rather advanced, wasn't it? This was the first stone-paved road in the European area and perhaps one of the first in the world. During and after the great days of Crete, kings on the Greek mainland built palaces at Mycenae and T-I-R-Y-N-S, fortified with thick cyclopean walls. From a distance, these structures looked not unlike ruined medieval castles. Up close, you see the crude strength of the ma massive masonry, of enormous stones with smaller stones plugging the chinks between them, and realize that here are relics of an earlier, simpler, and ruder world. Now, the, that stone masonry with large boulders and then smaller boulders just filling in the cracks, just making, just make the damn thing stand up already, will you? Has stood for thousands of years, so. Earlier, simple, ruder world, not from the medieval age when they were a little bit more sophisticated. Um, or certainly not from the Roman times when they were extremely sophisticated. No. An earlier, simple, ruder world. Alright, the Mycenaean kings also built remarkable beehive tomes for departed royalty. These tomes had the form of huge corbelled domes. Now we talked about corbelled arches, but imagine doing that in three dimensions. Corbelled dome. A ring of bricks, another ring set just a bit in, and another ring set just a bit in. Uh, and, and when you get it done, it, up at the top, it has the tendency to buckle out, and the top pushes down and it collapses. So you have to fi put fill dirt all the way around it. So it's a huge dirt mound with a brick cone in the middle, which is stabilized by the dirt on the outside. And you go inside it, and they bury people in there, you know. And you go inside it, it's 30, 40, 50 foot roof. Um, so uh, these tomes had the form of a huge corbel dome, which when finished were completely buried under tons of earth, making artificial hills. Buried with the dead were quantities of jewelry and masks of thin hammered gold. So, and we skipped just a bit. So far as engineering is concerned, the Golden Age of Greece was a natural outgrowth of the technical methods already worked out by various Mediterranean peoples in the days before written history. Now, that's fine. they saying the Greeks are going to come along, they're going to have their golden age, but it was already stuff that came from here, right? It's already stuff that came from this earlier age. Fine. And you could say that the, the men in the Renaissance, in the 15, 16, 1700s, were simply working on what the Greeks and Romans had worked out for them, right? But what about those bastards in the Middle Ages who were praying? So you can't just say this civilization was simply inheriting and expanding on. Because there are civilizations which inherited and sneered at and dumped what they inherited. So you've got to give the Greeks a bit more credit than just saying they inherited a lot of stuff from before them. Yeah, but how many civilizations have done that? Every civilization in history has inherited something. What did they do with it? That's the Greek question. So let's not hear any more snide remarks about the Greeks here. 
All right, on to the next chapter, chapter 4, the Greek engineers. We'll put these things to rest, shall we?